Uh, this is our annual uh, town hall for the James Webb Space Telescope at the AAS meeting. This is a, an event that uh, we treat very seriously. It's something that we put as, our, uh, as an event in our astronomy community engagement um, efforts uh, every year, and the program director attends and, and presents an update on how the James Webb Space Telescope is progressing on its way to its October 2018 launch date. Um, I want to start by thanking Northrop Grumman for providing the reception today, um, some food and snacks. There's also some ice cream in the back in case you didn't notice. Uh, please feel free to grab some. I want to make a couple of uh, introductory remarks and then I'll introduce our first speaker today. Um, so first, we have uh, two major events in 2015 related to JWST that I think the science community is going to be very interested in. The first is that we're starting to run a series of workshops that are intended to train the community on how to reduce data that will come from the James Webb Space Telescope. We had a session on Sunday at the AAS meeting as well, a morning session, and we're going to continue to have sessions every AAS meeting from now to after launch, in fact. And the meeting that we have at the Space Telescope Science Institute is going to be uh, held in May 2015. Um, and uh, the data analysis tools that are being developed for JWST will be released as Python packages. And if you come to this meeting or you send your students and postdocs to this meeting, they'll get a sense of how that infrastructure works, what some of the foundational tools are, and what some of the specific tools are that'll be useful for JWST. Second, um, we have, uh, in collaboration with our, our partners and our colleagues, the European Space Agency, a major scientific conference in October of this year called Exploring the Universe with JWST. Uh, this is the first large scientific, international scientific conference since our meeting at Space Telescope Frontier Science Opportunities back in 2011. And I think it'll be very interesting for this community and we, we're hoping that you, that you apply uh, to present abstracts and, and talks at this meeting and share with us the exciting ways that you plan to use JWST. So today, first, I don't think I introduced myself. My name is Jason Calari. I'm the project scientist for JWST at the Space Telescope Science Institute. Uh, we have three presentations. Um, the first is going to be given by Eric Smith, who's the deputy program director for the JWST project at NASA headquarters. Um, Eric's going to be giving an overall program status, the schedule, the budget, uh, the, the recent work that's happened in 2014, and what we have coming forward in the next couple of years. The second talk will be given by Mark Clampin, who's the observatory project scientist at NASA Goddard. Uh, Mark is going to be uh, describing the deployment of JWST from its launch to its uh, orbit at uh, L2. And then for a change of pace uh, relative to previous town halls, um, this meeting marks uh, a time that's only two and a half years from the cycle one call for proposals for JWST. So we're getting really close to the time that the community is going to be planning science programs and so we wanted to lay out some of the science policies and the science timeline and describe some initiatives that I think the community will be very interested in, in uh, getting involved and engaged with JWST early on. And then we'll leave some time at the end for a community discussion as well. The session today is being recorded. It's not being live streamed, but it's being recorded and we'll post it on our website at Space Telescope uh, following the AAS meeting. Um, if uh, folks would like to ask a question or make a comment and, and have that not be a part of the recording, that's fine. You can announce that when you ask your comment or question and we'll edit it out. You can also come and talk to me after and I'll make sure that it gets edited out of the record. So thank you very much for coming and with that I think I'll introduce our first speaker, uh, Eric Smith. While the presentation is loading up here, let me uh, thank Jason. And uh, I also want to uh, echo his thanks for folks coming out here during their dinner time to devote some time to listen to this and also to Northrop Grumman for sponsoring uh, the reception we have here. So as Jason mentioned, what I want to talk about is essentially what has transpired during 2014, talk about the year that we had on the program and project, and that was a very good year. Uh, and so it's fun to talk about that. And then also talk about what's going to be happening uh, in 2015 from a, from a top level perspective. 
So if we condense down um, you know, the hundreds of events and, and milestones that were accomplished, uh, I picked out just a few of them that were sort of major highlights or also had really cool images to go with them to talk about what we did during 2014. So we started off the year by completing the spacecraft CDR. This was the last major element of the whole observatory to go through its critical design phase, and it essentially moved almost all of the observatory into the manufacturing stage once this uh, successful milestone was passed. And I don't have an exciting picture of the hundreds of PowerPoint charts that were reviewed at this CDR. So folks are now beginning to recognize that there has been a lot of good progress over the years on the mission, and we had a very nice uh, event at Goddard where the uh, NASA Administrator Charlie Bolden came out uh, along with Senator Mikulski to just uh, compliment the team on the work that they had done. This was for 2013, uh, and that was a nice event for the folks uh, out at Goddard. So a couple of the major milestones that we had this year uh, included the delivery of the final two instruments. And so what you can see here is the installation of JWST's primary camera. This is the University of Arizona's NIRCAM instrument built with Lockheed Martin, PI, Marsha Riki, and this uh, is uh, going into the ISOM there. You can see the, the redundant halves of the instrument. And uh, so it has gone through a cryo cycle with the rest of the instruments. And uh, I'm happy to say the performance is excellent. And you should ask Marsha about it, because she will love to tell you about how great the NIRCAM is doing. Well, after the NIRCAM was installed, that meant we only had one instrument left to go. And that was the European Space Agency's near spec. And so here you can see the near spec. It is mounted on the outside of the ISOM, like uh, the mid-infrared instrument MIRI is on the other side of the ISOM. And so here you can see its final installation. And so with the installation of these instruments, now the ISOM was completed and ready to go into some cryo testing that happened in the summer. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. So we had another visitor, Neil Tyson, stop by to see some of the hardware and talk to some of the folks uh, working on the project. And that was an event that uh, I think everybody enjoyed. And uh, we all know Neil, and he enjoyed that event and enjoyed talking about the event while he was there. So a lot, of t a lot of times folks don't get to see some of the behind the scenes movement of a lot of these uh, space hardware elements. And so what we have here is a, a little video of when the ISOM is actually going to be transported from the, the clean room where all those instruments were installed and it's bagged. And now it is going to travel over to the, the space environment simulator, the SES chamber there at Goddard, where it's going to undergo its testing. It will uh, be in the chamber. It will see a, uh, a beam, a simulated beam from the primary mirror and uh, test out the instruments. And you, uh, so you can see we use these very high-tech method of pushing the ISOM from one end of uh, the Building 29-710 complex. Although, as you can see, it, there is a, a purge going on. And here is the top of the vacuum chamber uh, lifting off. And then they roll that back. And then the ISOM is going to be coming in from sort of the right uh, on the screen there. It comes down that hallway. They've got to lift it up once they get it close and then transport it and lower it down into the top half of the SES chamber, because the bottom half houses the telescope simulator. So in, in the subsequent video, you don't actually get to see the telescope simulator. It's below a floor uh, when they install this. So now that they've got it uh, lifted over that, and then they'll Yep, there we go. I think the guy in the black shirt is actually the person controlling the crane here. Yeah, and later on, I think you'll be able to see some of the folks, some of the uh, technicians down inside the chamber. Uh, there are folks down there to help guide it in once you've uh, got it positioned at the right place in the chamber. So this uh, movement was happening right around the beginning of the summer after uh, all those instruments had been installed and checked out and uh, all the measurements made before you put it into the cryo chamber. Oh, there you can see now it's installed and now they're moving the cover back over. 
And so now we're, we're about in June when uh, the chamber closes up here and they get ready for this uh, very large cryovacuum test. So in other areas, for many years, the mission pacing piece of the uh, program was the telescope itself, and in particular, the back plane. And so there was a very important event when uh, ATK finished their work and delivered. This is the flight back plane, and in this orientation, the mirrors would be looking down, and the cage, the back plane support uh, frame sits on top. The ISOM will sit inside that, and this is now, uh, you can see a picture of it out at Northrop Grumman, and it's about to undergo testing out there. Oops, hit the wrong direction there. And so an another very recognizable piece of web is, of course, its sunshade. And this summer saw a major test with the engineering unit for the sunshade. It's a full scale, uh, all five layers, and it was to test the deployment uh, plans and uh, procedures. And so we have uh, some great footage of folks working very quickly out at Northrop during this. You'll see a, a lot of folks are actually filming this as well. Most of the people in the dark uh, bunny suits there are filming this activity. So one of the important lessons that came out of this uh, activity was how cleanly separated the edge of that sun shield uh, ended up being, because that uh, clean separation there ultimately has a large effect on what the temperature of the layer five, the layer closest to the observatory is, which in turn affects the mid-infrared background that the telescope sees it's, it's itself. And so uh, that test showed us we have very clean separation, meaning we're going to get good uh, thermal performance out of the sun shield. So while that was going on out at Northrop, another large piece of test hardware arrived at the Goddard Space Flight Center. And now this is just the center section of the so-called Pathfinder telescope. Uh, this is a flight-like piece of hardware that we are going to populate with two mirror segments for testing out the integration and test procedures for the whole telescope over the coming year. And this is uh, in the installation uh, fixture out at the Goddard Space Flight Center in the same clean room where they work on the ISOM. And in this configuration, the mirrors look up. And so uh, at the end of a 116-day extremely successful test, the ISOM came out of that SES chamber. And uh, while there are many hundreds of people involved in making uh, that successful uh, through the 24-7 you know, shifts all summer long, there are, are two people in the audience here. I would like them to stand up and be recognized because uh, they did a tremendous job. And so Matt Greenhouse is the instrument scientist for JWST. And Randy Kimball is the uh, INT scientist for JWST. So you should thank these guys because they did a fantastic job uh, for that test. And, and then you can talk to them afterwards about the war stories from the test as well. So I mentioned that we put two uh, mirror segments on that Pathfinder backplane. And so here you can see a video of the robot arm that actually sort of holds the mirrors underneath and it translates them out then and lowers them down uh, onto the Pathfinder backplane. And so these, these are the procedures they're testing out because they'll follow the same procedures when you have the flight uh, article in there uh, later this calendar year. So it goes out, then it, it lowers it down, and then it sort of pauses here for a second before finally lowering. And then once it's down in that configuration, then eventually it gets uh, liquid shimmed or bonded uh, onto the the back plane uh, fixture itself. And that little the silver triangle in the center is a, uh, it's a fixture for measuring where the aft optic system goes. Now, after me, Mark Clamp is going to be talking about deployments. And so he'll have a piece about uh, the actual deployment of the secondary 
uh, tower that uh, occurred uh, both at Northrop Grumman. It was a motorized deployment. This is just an image from when they did a, a walkout of that Pathfinder at Goddard. Well, so after you did that successful test with the ISOM, they then ran it through what's called gravity sag testing, where you essentially make measurements of the ISOM in all different orientations to take out the vector of gravity. Uh, that happened uh, late in the calendar year. And then, of course, a lot of this is getting ready for the major activity that will be occurring this year, which is down at the very large thermal vacuum chamber at the Johnson Space Center. Uh, here you see some ground support equipment that is going to be lifted up into the top of that chamber. And I think you can see the scale of the chamber by the technicians uh, in it down there. And uh, so they are getting ready for that Pathfinder piece of hardware. You saw the mirrors installed towards the end of this month. They're going to be shipping that from Goddard down to Johnson, where it's going to undergo a series of tests that I'll talk about in a bit. Uh, and then uh, right near the end of the year, that chamber completed its, uh, its checkout and commissioning, and so it is ready to accept all the, the, you know, the engineering hardware and then eventually the flight hardware. And so this is a, uh, a super distorted view of that chamber. Uh, just because it is extremely huge and it's amazing and captured all in that one image. So, so that completed a very successful 2014, and now let's talk about what are we going to be doing this year. And so we, we like to keep these, these little mnemonics about what's going on in the program, and that represents what are the new things we're going to be doing each year. And so while last year saw this initiation of spacecraft manufacturing kicked off with the CDR, this year it's really about assembling the telescope. While we'll be doing additional testing on the ISIM and we'll be building the sun shield up and building the spacecraft up, the main thing that's going to be new for us this year is a lot of work with the telescopes. That's a pretty exciting time for the astronomical community. And if we look at a, a sort of a very high level summary then of where we are in the schedule, uh, this is now 2015 and out. And one thing I'd like you to notice uh, sort of on this schedule is that 2015 is really the last year where there's uh, substantial manufacturing efforts. Once we've moved into 2016, it's pretty much all INT from that point. You're putting these large pieces of hardware uh, together. You're integrating the sun shield. You're integrating the spacecraft. The uh, ISOM and the telescope get integrated. They, we call it OTIS from that point on, stands for Optical Telescope and ISOM. That's getting tested down at Johnson. So uh, last year for a lot of manufacturing. The red circles indicate the amount of funded reserve we have. It might be easier to see on this chart here. It shows we have 11 months of funded schedule reserve. The two other curves, the green curve on the bottom, dot dashed, is the normal Goddard recommended level of reserve for a mission. The blue is the plan that JWST has, recognizing that it's a larger, more complicated cryogenic mission, so we knew we needed more reserve. And importantly, we have currently even more reserve than planned at this stage. So we did use it a few times. We had to use schedule reserve this year. We expect to use schedule reserve in the future, uh, but we always want to try to stay at that blue line or above, and that's where we are right now. So what's coming up for the ISOM? Uh, they are completing some planned changes to the instruments. Some of the near-infrared detectors had to be changed out. I believe the Canadian Fine Guidance uh, instrument has all its changes completed now. Uh, I think they're going to be finishing up by the end of January. All the instruments will be complete their changes. And then it's going to undergo the normal sequence of vibration testing, acoustic testing, and uh, EMI, EMC testing before going into its final cryo test in the ISOM configuration. And that's where a lot of the, the all the ISOM requirements are going to be ratified or verified uh, at that point. I mentioned the work that's going to be going on down at the Johnson Space Center. You see two configurations here on the bottom. They're not the greatest CAD drawings. Uh, the OGSD stands for Optical Ground Support Equipment Testing. That Pathfinder is going to be tested early in the year, basically to test out and see how it changes shape as you change the temperature in the chamber. Later in the year, the aft optic system, which contains the, ter the flight tertiary mirror and fine steering mirror, are going to be installed along with a beam image analyzer. So you're actually going to be testing optically the system then. Uh, and so those are two big tests uh, occurring down at Johnson. In the sun shield area, they'll be completing the flight layers three, four, and five. Three is actually completed uh, already and start the manufacturing of the final two flight layers this year. 
the mid booms, those structures that pull it out, uh, will begin their manufacturing, flight manufacturing. They already have engineering units, and they'll be doing the acceptance testing on all the non-explosive actuator devices that you'll see, and Mark will talk about uh, when he talks about the deployments. And so there you see a picture of the layer three finished on the bottom, and that the picture on the right is the current status of layer five. There's just a few big pieces that need to be seen together. In the spacecraft, there was a lot of hardware uh, coming together uh, all through 2015, and uh, the other major element that's in the spacecraft we'll be completing in 2015 is the Miri cryocooler. Uh, and there you see a picture of the spacecraft bus with somebody kind of kilroying uh, up out of the center. There you can just barely see his head. And you see one of the equipment panels that go along the sides that will hold uh, a lot of the equipment, the electronics boxes that go with the spacecraft. So I'd like to summarize saying that 2014 was a very successful year for the program. The instruments performed fabulously during their cryo test. Uh, that test was absolutely uh, amazing uh, in its success, and a lot of credit goes to all the folks who put in a lot of time, uh, not only during the summer, but for the many years before to develop that system. It was, it was beautiful to see that come together. Uh, all the technical performance for the observatory, so things like the level one requirements, the sensitivities, the lifetimes, they're being met with margin. So we are delivering on the promise, the scientific promise uh, that the mission has. Uh, full swing on the manufacturing for spacecraft and SunShield, and 2015 is really the year of the telescope. And uh, as I have been delighted to say for the past couple of years, we are staying within the replan budget, and we are on schedule for the October 2018 launch. Thank you. Okay, so good evening. Thank you for coming out to uh, hear us talk about JWST. Just waiting for it to sync up here. So this year, the project put out a new uh, video showing the uh, deployment of the telescope uh, following launch. So what I'm going to do tonight is talk about uh, and show you that video, walk you through what happens after we actually launch the telescope, and show you how a lot of what you've been seeing in these videos over the last five or six years is now becoming reality as you do these, uh, as we start to do deployment testing of the telescope and some of its subsystems. So just to start off with a reminder, uh, we are going to be launching from uh, French Guiana in Kourou on an Ariane 5, and one of the reasons that we need to do deployments after launch is that JWST is too big to fit in the uh, fairing unless it's actually stowed into a configuration that allows us to install it. It's also a direct insertion launch, so we have no phasing loops or any of that kind of stuff on the way to L2. We just get launched straight into a um, L2 orbit with a couple of burns on the way. So just as a sort of quick 101, uh, JWST has a number of major deployments after launch, and you can see these identified in this chart here. The first one is the primary mirror. We have to fold uh, six of the mirror segments, three on each side around the side of the package to stow them for launch. We have a deployable tower that we have to uh, stow, and I'll get into that in more detail in a few minutes. The secondary mirror has to be folded up and stowed around the uh, telescope. And then the whole sun shield, which is the uh, means by which we achieve passive cooling and operational temperature of the telescope, also has to be stowed and then folded up around the telescope. So there's a lot of stuff that has to be stowed before launch and then packed uh, or unpacked after launch. So let's start with the first part of the video. So we're going to start and walk through, and then I'm going to stop it at different places to emphasize different things. So launch vehicle separation occurs just here, and we do some initial rate damping just after launch. And the first thing to notice here is that just 30 minutes after launch, we're already doing our first deployment. We need to get the solar panel out, and we need to be able to start getting power to the system. We then do some uh, attitude adjustments, and you'll see these throughout the video. Uh, we release some hardware. The antenna, uh, communications antenna, is released, but it's not deployed. And then straight after that, we do our first burn, which takes us to um, 
L2. So this is called uh, mid-course correction 1A, and it's the most important of the burns that we do post-launch. So at that point, um, we will then deploy our communications antenna in a few minutes, as you'll see it come up, so we can start talking to the Earth. And you'll see at the bottom of the chart there that we're already pretty much at the distance of the moon at that point. So all of our major deployments occur once we're past the moon, well on our way into uh, deep space to L2. And uh, we have an illustration here just showing you where the manned spaceflight uh, record is for, uh, it's held by Apollo 13. So at this point, we start doing the major deployments about three days after launch. And the first thing we want to do is put out the sun shield. And the sun shield is on two pallets. We put out the four pallet first. And then the pallet on the rear side is also released. These are all locked down and held in place by launch release mechanisms during launch so that they uh, are moving around. Here comes the second one. So we deploy the pallets, and then the next thing that we want to do is achieve thermal separation between the telescope, or the OTE as we call it, and the uh, spacecraft bus, which has all the warm electronics in it. So we have a tower which basically telescopes up and lifts the uh, telescope off of the spacecraft bus. And this is the tower. So this shows you the tower in the stowed configuration here. And this is what it looks like when it's deployed. It's basically a series of nested um, composite cones that are driven by a motor to extend and deploy. And what you see here, this thing looks kind of looks like a robot. These are actually the cable trays. And they're designed so that as the tower deploys, they extend and uh, we carry all the harnesses up to the OTE and don't get any entanglements or uh, problems there. And there's a second cable tray just here. So that's the. Uh, first major deployable, the uh, tower. The next thing we need to do is get the sun shield out and deployed so that we can start getting the telescope cold. And the first thing we have to do is release uh, covers. The whole membrane uh, package is covered by additional membranes. And these are on spring-loaded um, inserts, which basically, when released, you know, just roll up and move out of the way. And this is absolutely crucial, because otherwise the membranes would get too hot during uh, the deployment uh, during the launch. Here you see the first of the um, two major sun shield deployments. This is the mid boom deployment number one, and we basically have a telescoping boom on this side and this side, which pull out all five layers at the same time. So that's the first part of the uh, deployment. The second part is a rim deployment here, which is basically separating the layers at the core at the spacecraft bus. And then we have a series of cables which are tensioned using motors, and we independently tension each layer one by one so that we achieve the required separation and alignment of each of the layers. So up until this year, that was pretty much all people had seen of how we're going to do this. Eric has already talked about this a little bit. So what I'm going to do is just walk you through that sunshield deployment test in a little more detail. So the first thing to know is that this test is done on what's called an independent verification article, which doesn't give you much of a clue that it's for sun shield testing, but that's what it's for. And this is located at Northrop Space Park facility, and it's basically a full-scale JWST simulator that's designed to do sun shield deployment testing and also to do things like fit checks to make sure we understand how all this stuff comes together and what the clearances are when we actually are stowing things. So all of the testing you'll see is being done on this facility here. Next, a uh, couple of things to know about the sun shield. So this is what the five layers look like when they're deployed. We actually deploy them to what we call flight tension, or one times uh, flight tension. And so there's a little bit of gravity sag. And uh, I'll explain uh, how we deal with that when we're actually trying to measure the shape of the membranes in a minute. A couple of things to know. This is that center region, the rim hub, where we do the initial separation. I'll show you that in a minute. Um, these edges of the sun shield are called light lines, and we're very concerned about how each of those layers and their light lines align, because we don't want the telescope having a view to any of the light lines on the, the bottom layers, which are warm. Uh, you can see here, this is a catenary cable, and these are the things that actually tension the uh, sun shield. So there's four of those uh, that run through, and they're all tied together. So that's uh, what the sun shield looks like and how it's put together. 
And when we do the deployments, we actually have to do some gravity offloading. And since we can't actually suspend the membranes by cables, since they have to start folded up, we actually do the gravity offloading by having them on a big polythene table, as you can just see down at the bottom here. Now, I mentioned the rim. This is what the rim of the core on top of the, sun, uh, the spacecraft bus looks like. It's basically a big concertina, and each of the sun shield layers attaches to a different uh, segment of the concertina. When it's released, the concertina springs apart, and you get the separation of the five layers. So that's what's happening in the center of the sun shield when we do that part of the deployment. And then finally, just another, oops, sorry. Another word on the tension. One of the things we do as we qualify the flight membranes is we need to measure their shape and make sure that you know, they actually conform to the requirements. And in order to do that, when they're being made down at Nexolve in Huntsville, we actually have to go to three times flight tension to actually get the correct shape as it would be on orbit. And then we do cup up and cup down, upside down measurements so that we can back out the gravity. So you've already seen this video, but I'm going to start from the very beginning. So this is a, a deployment test that took about three days. We took a day each to pull out the um, layers, and then a third day to do the tensioning. And you can see the simulated mid-boom here pulling out the membrane. It stops at this point here. And then uh, the thing reverses, and we tension up the final part of the membrane by pulling it out rather than pulling it out with the um, mid-boom. Same on this side. On the real mid-booms at a certain point, the uh, motor reverses, and then the last piece is just pulled out using the cables. And you see that happening here. So that's meant to happen. So at this point, we're pretty much ready to go to the next and the most important step, which is the tensioning. And the way it works is we start up here, and then we step round and go round to each of the four corners for each of the five layers. So it takes quite a while to do this. And as Eric said, I've cut out a lot of the film crews, but there was a lot of interest in this, so we had film crews in there to, to do the Hollywood thing, and we also had film crews actually filming all this so that we could go back and study it in more detail later on to understand how the thing was performing. So you can see we're starting to tension the layers now. Then they take a break, then we come back, a few more interviews, and then we continue with the tensioning. And you can see this chap in the middle is just monitoring um, the deployment from the inside of that uh, rim hub region. And that, that is the uh, deployment. So we actually learned a lot about the scientific um, performance aspects of this as well as the uh, deployment aspects. As Eric said, this test went extremely well, and it's a testament to the work of the SunShield team at uh, Northrop Grumman that this test, which was the first full-scale deployment out of the box, went so well with absolutely no major hiccups. You know, things went exactly as planned. So we were extremely pleased with the way that worked. I'm going to talk about what comes next in a few minutes. But a couple of things that we were very pleased with was the alignment of the edges pretty much uh, matched what we were expecting. And we also got the correct separation between the layers, which is very important so that the uh, sun shield behaves thermally as we expect it to. And you can actually see in the background here, this is the third scale sun shield that we actually used to do a thermal test uh, several years ago just to verify our thermal models of the sun shield. So let's move back to the deployment now. So we've got the sun shield out, and we continue with the deployments. The next thing we put out is our momentum management flap, which, flap, which just allows us to balance momentum. And then the next big deployment that we're going to do um, is going to be the radiator shade deployments. So these are basically flaps that just uh, help the performance of the spacecraft bus radiators. And then the next big deployment that we're going to be doing is the first of the OTE deployments coming up. We start the cryocooler for MIRI, and then we do the secondary mirror deployment. And this is where we drive a motor which then pushes this thing into place. So as you heard earlier, this is the second uh, big deployment test that we've been able to do this year. The Pathfinder, I think, has already been described in some detail, so I'm not going to spend too much time on this. But what I'll say is before it was shipped to Goddard, we took the opportunity with this piece of hardware to do a power deployment as opposed to a walkout. So there are two types of deployment tests we do. The first thing we do is a walkout, where it's all driven by weights and pulleys. 
And then the next stage is the actual power deployment as it would be done uh, on orbit. As the uh, hardware at this point doesn't have a spacecraft bus with all its computers and electronics boxes attached to it, we have to do a lot of sort of manual activation of the motors. So you'll see a lot of people running around attaching stuff, unattaching stuff. And that's because at this stage, we have to do a lot of manual acti activation of these motors. So that's what's going on here. So this is going to be um, a bird's eye view of the Pathfinder being deployed. This is a power deployment, the uh, motors down here. This is a hinge, and then the other hinges are down here. So it's all driven by the motor just here. And you see it almost deploys, and then they stop. And then we um, have a crew come in and uh, hook up a uh, controller so that they can run the final motor, which is a latch. Uh, motor and that basically just drives the latch that hooks into a hook and just locks everything into place. So that's how it works on orbit and of course the neat thing here is you can put it away again when you're done and try again. So we're going to be doing lots of these um, as we put the flight hardware together. And then this is just a different view of the same deployment. Uh, gives you a better idea of the scale of this thing. Um, Again, a lot of people there taking pictures and also just there for safety and to uh, monitor the different parts of this deployment as we do this very first powered um, deployment of the secondary mirror uh, structure. So once again, another really successful test. And uh, we're starting to transform what was just video cartoon concepts now into real hardware and demonstrating with the real hardware that this works as it's supposed to work. So I will move on then to the final part of the deployment. Um, we then do an aft uh, radiator deployment on the back of the iSIM. There's a radiator that has to deploy to have its optimum viewing angle. And then the final big deployment of the wings. And once they're locked into place and then latched down, we have a working telescope. But we're not done with the telescope deployments at this point. Once we've got all the wings latched into place, we actually have to use the actuator motors to lift the motors off of their launch locks and put them into place so that we can start the alignments. And then finally, we get to the second, and, sorry, the third and final uh, mid-course correction, which injects us into the L2 halo orbit. So that whole process takes around 23 days. And since we're about to hit L2 here, I'll just make a quick comment on the environment at L2. So those of you who were at the Gaia talk this morning probably heard uh, adverse comments about sandblasting of mirrors and dire warnings. We actually have a pretty good understanding of what the environment at L2 is, and we're working very closely with the uh, Gaia team at uh, ESA uh, at STEC. And the predictions that they're giving us for these very small particles, which are submicron, uh, consistent with the models that we have been using for our end-of-life performance. So right now, what Gaia is seeing, we already have enveloped into our end-of-life predictions. So there, there isn't really a big concern here. It's nothing that we didn't already have in our models. So just to finish up, what's next? Well, the next thing that we'll be doing is another one of these full-scale SunShield deployment tests sometime um, in the next couple of months. And then we'll be doing uh, power deployments of the mirror backplane wings and then the uh, flight secondary mirror structure once it's installed. And the point I wanted to make up as we sort of come to the end of this talk is that our observatory INT program has a lot of milestones in it where we do um, initially subsystem deployment testing. So as we build up the flight hardware, we're doing these big um, deployment tests. And that culminates as we get to 2018 in a final, you know, complete end-to-end -end deployment test of the whole observatory once it's uh, been integrated. So uh, this is just a nice picture of the back plane with the wings, and we're getting ready in a month or so to do a deployment test of those wings as well. So I'll just finish up by just making a, a note here. This is the overall commissioning schedule. Commissioning is six months. The uh, observatory deployment, this red bit at the beginning, is about 23 days and then another six or seven doing some sort of housekeeping stuff with the uh, deployments. We will start the uh, instruments uh, power on and uh, doing observatory calibrations once we've got the uh, deployments done. So the instruments will already be cooling down as soon as we get the sun shield out. 
And uh, the major piece of work during the commissioning is actually the telescope phasing. And then once we've got that done, we have this period at the end where we can really do pointed observations, early release science, and then segue into science operations. So I will finish there and hand over to Neil Reed, who's going to talk about science policy. And I'll just once again thank the uh, folks at Northrop and, and Goddard on the Sunshield team and the OTE teams for all the really great work they've done this year. And just apologize to John Ehrenberg for hacking into little pieces his beautiful deployment video. Thank you. presentation is launching. Good. So I, I should actually probably call this science policy implementation. We don't set science policy at Space Telescope. Science policy is handed to us from the Mount, Mount Ararat of NASA headquarters. We look at the implementation. And the, the people who are, who are working on that, Jason, you've already seen. Jennifer, Janice, and Rachel are all, are all here too. So if they can stand up, um, I'll share this with my conspirators. So. Um, <laughs> So our main charge at Space Telescope is to maximize the science that's, uh, that's been carried out on the missions that we're supporting. That means we need to maximize the science for you guys out there. Um, looking at James Webb in particular, we've got a mission that's got a five-year uh, requirement, a 10-year goal. That's a shorter mission than Hubble, something we have to tell to ourselves. It's a longer mission probably than Spitzer. JWC is going to have a range of observing programs. Maximizing the scientific potential of JWST using those observing programs is going to require an informed community. Um, we need to make sure that you guys get up to speed rapidly in what the telescope can do. That's what we we'll are talking about a bit today. Data access is key to that. Um, the best way to understand how something works is to get your hand on some data and play around with it yourselves. So one of the things that we're talking about at the end of this talk is early release science, how we want to get uh, real science data out there to the community so that people can understand how JWST works as fast as possible. I should also say that in this, um, we're not working alone. We have, uh, those of you who can remember back to Space Telescope, there was, a, there was a stack, the Space Telescope Advisory Committee, drawn from the community, high level uh, people within the community who could help us set policies for community usage. We have the J stack. Uh, as you will see going through this, we're very, we're very unadventurous in the, name, the way that we pick names. So the stack has become the JSTAC. They're the representatives of the science community. Um, we have a picture of them here. It's not a great picture. If you're standing up and behind to the left of Garth, you'll notice he has a fine head of hair. Uh, <laughs> and you also notice that almost everybody's paying attention to the speaker there, except for Malcolm Longer, who was on the stack and knows everything. Uh, so the, stack, the JSTAC has been helping us set up some of the policies I'm going to talk about here. So what am I going to talk about? One thing is just a, a basic science planning timeline. I'll just step through that. Mark has already gone through what's going to happen during the commissioning phase. I'm going to look at uh, milestones in terms of how you will get to use the, t uh, the telescope going forward. I'll talk about types of observing programs. And then the final part is talking about this early release science program. <laughs> so the timeline. And I guess one thing I should say, all of these talks, there's a lot of stuff here. The talks are going to be uh, posted on the JWST webpage, so you'll be able to see it and go through it afterwards. Launch, 2018 October, we know that. Uh, the first six months after launch, as Mark has said, will be, uh, will be devoted to commissioning, um, stepping through the instruments one by one. One point to make there is that there will be science verification data taken with those instruments, but the main point of those data are to determine whether you can calibrate the instrument rather than getting calibration data. That comes later. The first. Uh, Science observations you should see from uh, JWST will be the early release observations. That's the, um, the, 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 this is how we establish to the, the public at large that in fact we've got something that works. This is what's been done with Spitzer, what's been done with Hubble. So they will probably happen towards the end of that six month, uh, six month phase. Then something you should be interested in, the call for proposals for cycle one, geo observing on JWST is scheduled to go out in 2017 November which is less than three years away. That sets uh, an important, uh, that's, that's a kind of fiducial point for a number, of other, uh, uh, another, uh, number of other events that happen. One of them is the GTO observer, the guaranteed time observers, the PIs of the instruments, the interdisciplinary scientists who've been working to make sure that JWST can in fact do the science that we all want it to do. 
Um, they submit proposals, same as with every other uh, great observatory. They have first cut on the science because they've invested the time to make sure that the observatory is up there and working. So they will put in their proposals for cycle one seven months, seven months before uh, there's a first submission and then things get finalized two months before the cycle one deadline. They have priority in those on specific observations of specific targets um, that are protected and a full list is going to be available at the cycle one deadline so that you know what's happening there. You can, uh, you can um, gauge your science accordingly. The cycle one schedule for GOs, deadline is going to be in February 2018. So four years from now, there'll be a bunch of people furiously putting together their proposals. The TAC will happen in May. We're, and then science observing is scheduled to start April 2019. Um, we're anticipating annual observing cycles. That means that cycle two, and I'm going to, I'll come back to this, uh, this schedule later, the cycle two call is going to go out in September 2019. The deadline, probably December, um, February the TAC, and then start observing in April 2020. And all of these, I should say, these are, as it says there, this is a draft schedule that we're working to. I don't anticipate these changing much, but I'm not going to be, if, if they do change, it's a draft. But this is, this is kind of how things are, are, we're planning at the moment. Okay. So observing programs, what kind of observing program do we have? Well, JWST is going to be an L2. It's not going to be, so I'm speaking from, a, if you like, a Hubble perspective. We're not going to be doing it in our orbits. We're doing this in hours. Uh, all of the observing programs in JWST will be scheduled in wall clock time. Overheads are going to be incorporated into that allocation. So there's 876 hours per year. That turns into something like 5,000 to 6,000 hours of on-target integration time. As we'll see, that's quite a lot of time. What classes of program are there? Well, the guest observer programs, 80% of the first five cycles is going to go out to you and the community. There's the guarantee time observers programs. They have 4,000 hours, so about five months, allocated over the first 30 months, which basically means the first three cycles of GWST. Um, there are constraints that I'll come back to on, on how that time is distributed among the, the different cycles. And then there's a director's discretionary time component as well, up to 10%, and I, I emphasize up to. Typically with HST, we don't use that 10%. So, and anything that's not used in DD time goes across to the geo pool. But of course, it's, 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 get, it's community observers who are using a lot of the DD time anyway. Like I say, there's for rapid response, but possibly also for targeted programs. So how much geo time is going to be available in cycle one? Um, I can't say for absolutely sure, since I don't know exactly how much the GTOs will want to use, but we can do a, a rough estimate. Take away 10% of the time for DD, you're down to about 7,900 hours. The NASA requirement policy for the GTOs is that they use between 25% and 49% of the, of the time available to GOs and GTOs. So a quarter of 8,000 is roughly 2,000. I'm, let's suppose the GTOs use 2,200 hours. That means there's 5,700 hours available to the GO community in cycle one. And as that little calculation there shows, that's actually more time than is available on Hubble at the moment. So there's a lot of time out there to be used by the community. There's also a lot of discovery space. These are, these are just sensitivity charts taken off of the, um, the JWST webpage. JWST is 10 to 100 times more sensitive and has higher resolution than anything that has gone before at these wavelengths. There's a big hole of discovery space out there that can be exploited. So that then goes into what, how do we going to divide up the time for um, different classes of program, different sizes of program in cycle one. So this is, again, this is not cast in stone, but this is kind of what we're thinking at the moment. Um, we suspect that we're going to have four different size categories. And as you can see there, we've been thoroughly imaginative in the names that we've chosen for those categories. They'll be small, they'll be medium, they'll be large, and they'll be very large. Um, initially, for the first cycle, we think it'll probably be small, medium, and large. And probably the balance will be the majority of the time, and by majority I mean just over 50%, will go towards a smaller program just because there is this enormous discovery space and we want to involve as large a fraction of the community as possible in uh, doing science with JWST. Probably as we get to the later cycles and there's more time available uh, since the GTO contribution is, is decreasing, probably in the later cycles we'll introduce the very large programs. But there will be a component of large programs in cycle one. We want to have a kind of, I think we will, we will go with a balance throughout. So there will be the scope for doing um, 
what, imaginative, ambitious programs in cycle one with, G with GWST. There'll also be a bunch of special cate cate uh, I mean, categories. You know, we're gonna copy from whoever else. There'll there will certainly be long-term observations. There'll be targets of opportunity. Um, there'll be treasury leg legacy programs that will, that will be designed to bring back high-level products to the community. And then there will probably be joint programs with other facilities. It's kind of like being a ship at sea here. Um, Hubble, if it's still going, as we hope, Chandra, possibly Almond NRAO, um, possibly ground-based OIR facilities, perhaps a joint program with TMT, who knows? I mean, none of these are, are actually set up yet, but these are things we're going, to look, we're going to explore how we can set them up going forward so that we maximize the science coming out of JWST. There are also going to be archival and theory and research programs, and as it says at the bottom, this is something we're continuing to discuss with the JSTAC. And we want to involve you in the discussion too. Okay, the next thing. Um, an early release science program. A program of the community, chosen by the community, for the community, to uh, steal from one of your better presidents. Um, so what is this? So JWST is a very large program. It's NASA's highest science priority. It's one of the largest science programs ever undertaken by the US. So you can say, well, JWST needs to be correspondingly productive. Now, that's a very passive way of stating that. I think it's, more, it's better to go to the active side and say, we need to make JWST productive. It's our responsibility in the community, you here, everybody out there, to actually get the science out of this that justifies what we're spending on it, because we can do that. So it's an incredibly powerful machine. I mean, we've got the science case. These are the four themes uh, that established JWST in the first place. First light, galaxy evolution, looking at star formation, planet formation, studying the origins of life. And you know, one score and one year ago, we didn't know much about exoplanets, but that's an area that's clearly going to be very important with JWST. Um, there will be, with JWST, we will be able to characterize the atmospheres of transiting exoplanets. So that's, and, and we'll also be able to study details of the solar system that we can't study at the moment. Putting those two pieces together is going to be one of the major th science themes of JWST. It's a, so it's an incredibly powerful machine. It's also complicated. Uh, this is an eye chart that's designed to make you think how complicated it is. It has lots of instruments, lots of filters. It has integral field units. It has multi-object spectrographs. A lot of these instruments are being, are, are being used on ground-based telescopes at the moment. Nobody's done this in space before. Uh, getting a hang of how to use these instruments is going to be difficult. This is why you need access to data, to actually see how the instrument is performing so that you can design your science to take, to, to take the maximum advantage of what the potential is there. And that's going to be tricky. This is a blown up. So this is the cycle two proposal schedule again. Call for proposals got out in September 2019. That's five months into the cycle. Supposing you start preparing the proposal a month afterwards, six months into the cycle, then the deadline seven and a half months into the cycle. There's not going to be an awful lot of non-proprietary data available at that point from, from just the standard process. Um, so if you've got data, if you, if you get time in cycle one, maybe you'll get lucky. But we want to actually try and make uh, JWST as available as possible to the community so that it, you don't actually have to win the lottery first time around in order to take advantage of the second opportunity. This is something that the JSTAC pointed out early on. Looking at the way that the, uh, the cycle deadlines, uh, the proposal deadlines lined up with the cycles, Garth Ellingworth pointed out you wouldn't actually see the whole of cycle one data until the deadline for cycle four. And having three cycles where you can only see partial data is really not good. So the, the JSTAC advised us back in 2010, we need to put in place some kind of quick look, early release science program that will get data out there to the community. You need to demonstrate the key modes. You need to put the data out both in raw form and with, in calibrated form so that this understanding can build. We've gone through this concept with the science working group as well. Uh, we, the JSTAC has returned to it. and We've discussed it with them uh, many times, refining the concept. And if you look at the letter, uh, all of the JSTAC letters are actually posted on, on the, um, the JWST webpage. Looking at the March letter from uh, last year, the JSTAC brought this down to uh, a set of, what, goals, requirements for carrying out this type of program. So the goal of the program is to maximize the science impact by educating the community as to the science capabilities. 
ensuring rapid data availability so the community can generate proposals for cycle two and engaging the community in the planning of those programs. So we want to involve you guys in actually setting up the early release science program. If we're going to achieve that, those goals, then the program has to cover a wide range of scientifically interesting uh, topics, providing scientifically interesting data sets. We need to exercise a wide range of the expected to be used modes. We need to carry it out early in the cycle, and we need to begin the planning process involving the community. So this is basically what we're, we're starting to talk with you about now. And what we are planning on doing is, is that the, the overall concept, the organizing principle, is that we will put together a set of science-driven observing programs that are designed by the community and selected through proposal peer review. These won't be exactly, this is not exactly a cycle zero um, proposal call, because we, these are not just science programs. There are going to be extra requirements in there. You want the programs to address specific technical challenges. You want to understand how well JWST will do in crowded fields, what happens, what happens in the, in the mid-infrared with high backgrounds, how do you do spectral extraction, multi-object ob observations, what are the pitfalls there. We'll probably support the program with director's discretionary time. Now, I realize at the moment we don't actually have a director, but I'm sure we can set up things so that he or she will feel compelled to, set, to set, uh, give time for this program. That means the data will have no exclusive access period. They'll be out there. Um, we want to get the observations specified and in place by the Cycle 1 GO call. That means that you've got a set of proposals out there that the community can look at and understand ways of applying. They can take the APT files and use them for their, their own programs as templates. Um, we can have archival programs. We can have synergistic GO programs that build on the early science. This is something that we're particularly seeing with the Frontier Fields and HST that we have a set of core programs there. We've got something like six or seven additional GO programs that are building on the science that you can do. So you put in the ERS programs as a core, and you build on that with synergistic programs. ERS programs won't duplicate GTO observations. GTOs have priority. On the other hand, the GO programs, um, there is no need for them to duplicate the ERS programs since they will happen. Um, and then also we will look to put together calibrated data products, and that will involve some STSCI support. So this is a kind of, this is a very hand-waving schedule as, as to how we, we plan to put the RS uh, in place. So we're talking at the moment, we're down here at 2015, we're starting the discussion about these programs. We need to define the science and technical priorities. The, the proposal submission and review, we will put somewhat in parallel with the GTO submission and review finalizing the ERS after the GTOs have made their selection clearly in order to avoid conflicts there. And then the observations we want to schedule in the first few months of cycle, uh, uh, cycle one so that they are available uh, to the cycle two proposers. So what's next? Well, we need to refine this concept. This is just an outline at the moment. We need to, to take this and put some more uh, flesh in it. We need to identify what challenges we actually need to address, what are the top challenges. We need to define what we want the programs to do. We don't want to set up an ERS program where we have something like 151 hour observations. That's not going to be helpful. So the, we'll probably be looking at some kind of size range of programs. We'll maybe be talking about, I don't know, 10 to 15 hours, maybe 20 to 30 programs. All of this needs to be thought through in detail and work out how we're going to address this. Clearly, we're going to want to have programs that can be executed in the first part of cycle one. Clearly, we want to avoid conflicts with the GTOs. That means that there will need to be some kind of flexibility in the targets that are submitted with these ERS programs. Um, we need to work out the implementation timeline. I expect that there will be funding involved as well, since these are going to be PI-led, not PI, well, yeah, they are, they are, they are PI-led proposals. So the overall program we're going to shape based on your input, and we'll circulate, I say a poll, I actually mean a kind of questionnaire just to get your input. We'll be circulating that in the near future to, to start planning that out. Um, and that's about it. So that's the timeline. Four years from now, you should be all having your proposals ready for cycle one. Four and a half years, we'll decide what the, what the program is. Uh, and then we launch it. Um, so that's, uh, and actually just to, so some of us will be at the SDSI booth for the rest of the week. I am fleeing the country. I'm going back to snowy Baltimore. But uh, Jennifer, Janice, Rachel, and Jason will be around, so you can pester them. Or there's an e email address, jwst underscore ers at sdsci.edu, where you can send any suggestions or thoughts that you have at the moment. And feel free to bombard me with email as well. I mean, I'm used to it. 
That's why I'm there. And finally, I will just complete the circle and go back, and these are the two events that Jason talked about at the outset. So thank you for your attention, thank you for coming out here, and I guess we're open for questions. Okay, great. Thank you to all of the speakers. So we have 15, 20 minutes for uh, questions and comments from the audience. Uh, we have microphones set up in the aisle, so please uh, come to a microphone if you want to ask a question. And also, as a reminder, we're recording the session for those folks that couldn't be here today. If you wish your comment or question to not be in the recording, just let me know. So do we have any comments or questions for Eric, Mark, or Neil? Yep, okay, can you come to the mic, please? Please say who you are as well. Hi, good evening, uh, my name's Nick Ross from the University of Edinburgh. Uh, can I just see the plan again for the, the, the ERS programs? I've got, I've got a question and a comment. <laughs> so, with the timeline? Yeah, yeah so, so it doesn't give much time, if ERIS can't reproduce GTO, will, you know what, will one know what the GTO programs are? It doesn't look as if there's much time. I, I, th I think there's, I mean, the, several of the GTOs are sitting in here. The, the first submission is in April. Uh, the, they don't have to finalize until September. But there's going to be, um, there's a lot of sky out there. You know, there's a lot of things you can do. Uh, so I don't believe that there will actually be an issue. I mean, it's certainly something, there, there is, if you're gonna get this ready for cycle one, there isn't a lot of time in there to work with. You don't want to shove things out too far. But certainly there will be enough time to get, and I mean, and also I, the, we will, the GTOs will be, com, will be communicating with us along the way, so we'll have some idea of what they're planning and doing, and whatever, whenever they feel free to tell us, then certainly we can, uh, that can, something will be passed on. But I actually, I think it's manageable, actually. Okay, and kind of a slight follow-up or related question. What, what's the current thinking from the J, from the committee about data proprietary? Should all the, why, should the, is there still a proprietary period, and if so, why? Propri the, 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 proprietary, the proprietary period. So there are recommendations that, are be, uh, that, are, that have been made by the JSTAC. Um, they have recommended that large programs have zero proprietary time and they've recommended a six month uh, proprietary time for the regular programs, the small and mediums. And that's something that the Science Working Group has also, they've endorsed, that, there's a, uh, endorsed that, those recommendations. But th there are actually negotiations underway that Eric can talk about. Uh, I mean, it's, it's something that's been discussed with, with the Astrophysics Subcommittee here, and I mean, Eric can take it on for them. Sure, so, uh, so one of the uh, policies that NASA set up when it established the Institute was that the director of the Institute could recommend the uh, exclusive use period for the data. And so based upon advice that uh, Matt had received from the JSTAC, they were looking at a six-month option. And so we've actually, at NASA, uh, asked our advisory body, the Astrophysics Subcommittee, Paul Hertz and the Astrophysics Division, has asked that group to sort of, you know, fan out through the community and talk about that, talk about the pros and cons. We had our science working group do the same thing. And so there are documents. Uh, again, on the website that Neil mentioned about, you know, this is the rationale behind the recommendation, here are the things that the science working group thought about it, pros and cons, and now the community discussion is starting as well. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, do we have any other comments or questions? Yep, Ned. Okay, I noticed that the ERS observations are less than six months in duration, so that means you're going to have a range of right ascensions that you can observe. Uh, it will be shifting along with the launch dates, if the launch date shifts, let's hope not. So it's that's uh, going to be a problem, and will the director exercise authority on, uh, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of you know, why is 0855, you know, the coldest brown dwarf, it's a clear um, target for JWST observations. And, you know, will the director exercise discretion to make sure that whoever takes that data has a very short um, proprietary period? I'm in the fortunate position of saying I cannot speak for the director at all. He doesn't exist. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I mean, I. 
I believe there are certain objects that uh, certain objects that are certainly going to get, get observed, and I, we can't guarantee how they will be observed. But clearly, it's up to the community to try and put those obser observations forward and think about the rest of the community with that in mind. Okay, Steve. Steve Rodney, Johns Hopkins. Uh, could you talk a bit about the um, TOO uh, constraints in terms of uh, how rapid, what sorts of uh, availability there would be for rapid TOO observations? That's an implement. We haven't actually discussed that in any kind of detail at all. I mean, cer certainly with JWST, the turnaround time, the, the actual feeding of observations to JWST happens on a shorter time scale than with HST. So there are. Um, there is the capability to respond faster in a more routine way, but in terms of policy constraints, we haven't actually got to the point of addressing that yet at all. You can you can send us your input as well. Yeah, we you know we're basically working on a forty. It's really difficult to do anything less than forty-eight hours. So, for cycle one, we're saying we have a forty-eight-hour minimum is the sort of the minimum target of opportunity response. You know, we have two contacts with uh, satellite a day, uh, once every 12 hours nominally, and the 48 hours is sort of the time it takes on the, on the ground to replan the observations, get, get the command load set, upload it to the satellite, which happens only once every 12 hours, and that's, so 48 hours is what, you sh is what we're working with. That was George Sonneborn, by the way, from NASA Goddard, the operations project scientist for JWST. Any other comments or questions? Okay, if not, let me thank everybody for coming, and we'll see you again next year.